favorite team we come in was it was told this morning we're in this team. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to continue in this series uh, of the seven letters in, in Re Revelation, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll start on uh, four and five, which are soon. It's taking a, a week for every letter because there's so much in this. Uh, and so uh, this one really hit me hard today. It's the letter to Thyatira. And the message is called The Deep Things of Satan. And one of the things that really hits home, if you are a pastor and you're putting these messages together, you sometimes gloss over the reality that Jesus is speaking to the pastor of each church. And so the emphasis is on what we do with the church. Uh, and so uh, it, it's really, this one's a, a, a really profound message because everyone seems to try and beat uh, Thyatira to, into the ground and say it's the precursor of the uh, Catholic Church and all the rest of it. And I know that we've got a lot of uh, ex-Catholics who come to this church, and I know some very nice Catholic people. There's nothing wrong with the uh, um, uh, people who have faith in Jesus Christ and feel that they still uh, need to go to that. We had a friend years ago um, who actually gave me this pulpit more than 20 years ago. A little church in Tewart Hill was closing down, and, and um, the pastor said to Katie, um, do you want anything? She said, oh, well, I'll take the, um, the pulpit. And then she thought, well, I don't know what to do with it until um, we started coming around and, and uh, talking to her. And she said, oh, you'll need this. So I love it. I mean, I've always thought of getting a fancy one, but this thing's, I don't know, it seems to be anointed. I, I become different when I come around and stand behind this thing. So this is a really profound message for uh, all of us. And I'll tell you why when we get into the body of the letter. letter. And I'll read out the, the verses. Uh, it's actually twice as long, roughly twice as long as all of the other uh, um, letters. It's 12 verses and a lot of the others are 3, 4 and 6. So uh, it, it, Jesus is really getting serious with church in this letter. And we start off in verse 18, Revelation 2, verse 18. And to the angel, the angelos, the messenger, the pastor of the church in Thyatira, write this. The son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet are like burnished bronze says this. I know your deeds, your love, your faith and service and perseverance and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and she teaches and leads my bond servants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent and she does not want to repent of her immorality. And behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation until they repent of her deeds. And I will kill her children with pestilence and all the churches will know, all the churches will know, including this one, that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast till I come. He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken in pieces as I also have received authority from my father. And I will give him the morning star, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And I'm assuming that if you come to Calvary Chapel, Perth, you have an ear to hear, and this letter is for you and it's for me. And this letter is a standout for several reasons. As I said, firstly, it's twice as long as the other letters. As Jesus' reference to his deity 
in the opening verse is far more serious than the others. Without directly speaking chastisement to the leadership, it is the most serious failure in this letter, the failure of godly leadership. And the city of Thyatira was smaller than the three previous cities that Jesus addressed in these letters to their churches, but it was still very commercially successful. Thus, life was normal for that time, and the city was full of trade guilds, which you and I would recognise as trade unions today. However, and here's the rub for the Christian, in these times, each trade guild had their own deity, their own God, that they worshipped and sacrificed to, and had to ceremonially pledge allegiance to. And if you wanted to work in Thyatira at this time as a tradesman, you had to belong to these guilds and they wielded great financial and religious power. A Christian acquaintance of mine regaled me quite a few years ago about this issue in the modern setting. And it was amazing. Um, he came to me, we, we were talking together uh, in another church more than 20 years ago. And uh, he was saying to me, uh, Stuart, uh, I was born and raised in England. He was um, of Asian descent, uh, English and Asian descent. And he was a quantity surveyor. Do you know what a quantity su surveyor is? <laughs> Some of you do. If you're going to build a massive building or even a large building, even this one, you need to know how many wall plugs you need, how many light bulbs you need, how many seats you need, how many tables you need. So a quantity survey does all of that collation and tells the uh, builder, the developer, what it's going to cost them to fit the room out. But it's very, very interesting. He said, Stuart, he said, um, times uh, in the post, you know, coal mine strikes and that in Britain, we decided a friend of mine who was also a, a, um, a quantity surveyor said, uh, uh, let's try South Africa. And for James from Chino Hills, half this church is South African, so I have to be very careful what I say, and apart from Americans and Californians. And, but the interesting thing is they went to, to South Africa and Bernard tried and tried and tried and applied for job after job after job. His friend, in total contrast, got a job within two weeks. And Bernard was at the end of his tether because he had his wife and his young kids there with him. And he said, I just don't understand. I've got the same qualifications. I've got excellent references. I cannot get a job. And finally, he went round to his uh, mate's house uh, and he said, I'm just at the end of my tether. I don't know what I've done wrong. And uh, he said, uh, I, every job I apply for, they're very nice, they're very polite, and they say, no, we don't have any openings for you. And his friend just laughed at him. And he said, Bernard, you need to go on the square. Do you know what that means? You have to join the Freemasons. You have to go to the lodge, all right? And if you go to the lodge, Bernard, you'll get a job the next day. And he just couldn't, as a Christian, bring himself to do that. So he left South, uh, South Africa and came uh, to Australia and found work and, and lived here for the rest of his life. He's passed away. But, you know, what is a, a major issue here 2,000 years ago in Thyatira? It's still the same um, problem in many societies in the Western, uh, Western world. And so we understand, and I certainly understand after talking to um, um, uh, Bernard about that, it really hit me that this in Thyatira and the other cities of these times, unless you were in a trade guild and, uh, and pledging allegiance to uh, false gods and, and taking part in things that are really uh, 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 horrible for a Christian to even contemplate, let alone take part in. And just to... Uh, Describe to you, uh, I've got a small passage out of Acts 19. It's one of my favourite passages. And it's 19, Acts 19, 22 to 32. And we start off in verse 22, and, and I've inserted Paul, having sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus, 
He himself stayed in Asia for a while. That's where these seven churches are. So he stayed there. His base was Ephesus, but he traveled around and he had a major influence in, in the churches that he visited. In verse 23, about that time, there occurred no small disturbance concerning the way. And the way there is the early name for Christianity. If you were in Judea, uh, they would call you the sect of the Nazarenes. But outside there in the Gentile world, they were called the way. And don't get me started on the way because we'll be here till four o'clock. But the way is associated with the zodiac because in Jewish uh, understanding, there was a thing called the Zoda and it was the 12 constellations in the stars. And I'm sure if you know Chuck Missler, like we know Chuck Missler, um, he would, uh, there is a, a, a thing that he does on, on the constellations. It's called the, the gospel in the stars. The only problem with that is I've, some people who have done that and tried to make a ministry out of it, uh, something happens to them. They either get sick or they get um, bankrupt or whatever. It's not a thing to do. And I often wondered about that. And then I thought uh, the reason why uh, God doesn't want you staring up uh, to, into the heavens to try and work out where we are in the way to heaven, uh, we've been given this little instrument here. And this is what you base everything on. Do you understand? That's why we've got the completed canon of scripture. Uh, but it's very interesting. But the way there, it was called the way or the Zoda, and then it was um, perverted by uh, the, the, the uh, Zodiac. And it staggers me, nominally intelligent people that I have worked with over the years hang out for 10 to 8 every morning on the radio station to learn what their stars for the day will be. Give me a break. And, and uh, Glenn Maxwell on uh, Curtin FM once forgot to do it at 10 to 8. And he got reamed out by his boss was when his boss arrived to work because he always listens to his stars. And apparently they jammed the switchboard saying, where's the stars for today? It is, you know, it, it's beyond my comprehension. And in verse 24, for a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, was bringing no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen of similar trades and said, men, you know that our prosperity depends upon this business. And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a considerable number of people saying that gods made with hands are no gods at all. You think? <laughs> not only is there danger in this trade of ours falling into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis be regarded as worthless and that she whom all of Asia and the world worship will even be dethroned from her magnificence. And when the crowd heard this and were filled with rage, they began crying out, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And the city was filled with the confusion and they rushed with one accord into the theater, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. And when Paul wanted to go into the assembly, the disciples would not let him. This is one of the few times when Paul did as he was told and repeatedly urged him not to venture into the theatre. So then some were shouting one thing and some another for the assembly was in confusion and the majority did not know for what reason they had come together. And so... This is my comment on this. This is a city of a quarter of a million people who were in uproar over the gospel of Jesus Christ taught by Paul and his fellow workers. And apparently he, Paul, and the others had successfully won over even some of the governing city officials. These same tensions were evident in all of the cities mentioned in these seven letters. You know, it's tough being a Christian uh, 
in these days, but it's always been tough being a Christian for the last 2,000 years because we are at enmity with the world. And sometimes people will be polite, but I have seen a growing animosity towards us worldwide, especially in woke Western culture. And, you know, they're now calling us terrorists and rebels and all the rest of it. Well, that's the name calling. That's the first stage. You just wait. And the above reference to Ephesus was 30 years prior to the writing of these letters, the dictation of uh, John taking dictation. Much speculation exists in the commentary about who established the church in Thyatira, possibly even the woman Lydia, who was a seller of purple dyed garments or even the purple dye itself, who Paul won to Christ when she was in Philippi. But I'm sorry, I still prefer the reality that the Messianic Jews from the Feast of Pentecost in 30 AD, who were converted by the preaching of Peter and who were from this region, went back to their um, cities and started these fellowships. So let's go into the exegesis of this really long uh, letter from Jesus. And to the angel, to the church uh, in Thyatira, write this. The son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet are like burnished bronze says this. The very same image that Jesus allowed to see in chapter one, causing him to faint at the feet of the king of kings and lord of lords, now uses this same imagery for this church. And I want to um, show you the difference between Um, this description of Jesus of himself to this letter for a reason. Have you got the screenshot, John? Thanks. There we are. In Ephesus, he's the one who holds the seven stars and and walks amongst the uh, lampstands. Smyrna, he was the first and the last. Pergamos, the one who holds The Sardis, he who has the seven. Philadelphia, he who is holy. Laodicea, the the amen and faithful. But look what he's saying about himself here in this church. He has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet are like burnished bronze. And the message is firstly, and this is what gets me, the message is firstly to the pastor of this church and the leadership who then have the absolute obligation to read this letter to the congregation and impose the meaning and the consequences of the assessment of Jesus, the head of the church, as to their daily witness for him in the city. Let me tell you right now, I might stand up here behind this piece of wood, but Jesus is the head of this church. And don't ever forget it. He is the head of this church. This verse is utterly fascinating as Jesus uses his divine title as son of God in this opening verse. And it's the only place in the entire book of Revelation where his divine recognition is used. So this church is in serious trouble. And secondly, his eyes like the flaming fire and his feet feet like, uh, feet like burnished bronze speaks of impending judgment. The eyes denote the omniscience and the omnipresence of Jesus with reference to the statement, I know. He knows all about me. He knows all about my wife, my family. And at some stage, I'm going to be called out singly out of the assembly of the raptured saints in heaven and I will have to stand before him before a cloud of witnesses, and I have to know that he knows. Are you all ready for that? Or do you just think, oh, well, I'll put it off till next Sunday? We all put things off, but I tell you what, that trumpet and that shout of that archangel is coming so quickly. And by the time we get up there, you have no opportunity to say, Jesus, can I go into the antechamber and just make things right. You make things right down here before you go up there. And I tell you what, it's hard for many Christians to go into their prayer chamber and face the things in their past and the things that have been done to them, the things they've done to other people and all the rest of it. But I tell you what, 
when you go up there, it's all laid bare. And all I want to hear is well done, my good and faithful servant, and what I want for every one of you that comes to this church to hear hear the same thing. Do you understand? That's why I really press into this uh, whole concept of being ready to go up. You know, so many people sell the idea of uh, the rapture on YouTube uh, channels and that sort of thing as, as, it, as if it's the greatest escape for Christians. Give me a break. Listen, I have to go to my hematologist twice a year. I have to go to my cardiologist twice a year. And I have to stand in a group of people waiting for the same um, specialist. And then all of a sudden, because you've done your bloods a week before, you get the name called out in front of everyone and you have to go into the office and you stand there and where well, you sit there sometimes and your heart's pumping and you say, what's the results going to be? And that's like, I, I, that's my training run for going up there because up till now, I've had good reports from my hematologist and my cardiologist, and I hope they write nice letters to Jesus and say, (laughs) my bloods are all good, all right? It's tough being a Christian, I'm telling you right now, and this this, um, um, letter really points it out because he's just identified himself in a judgmental image. But look what he says in the next verse, in verse 19. I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance and that your deeds of late are greater than the first. And deeds, the word in Greek is ergon, it means toil, work, labour, day after day, doing as Jesus required of us at his ascension to be his witnesses in this world, the salt and light. That's the baseline of what we're supposed to do. And the next word, love, I, when I was putting this together, I just assumed uh, that this would be the Greek word phileo, which is uh, the, the word for brotherly love, which is paramount within in loving uh, um, congregations like this. But no, this love, in this um, um, uh, uh, commendation by Jesus, it's agape love. Whoa, that is a higher standard than phileo ever could be. Which is the love, the divine love, which emanates from our heavenly father down to us in the form and person of his son. And these congregants were loving the sinners of Thyatira in the same way as God loves us. Agape love, that really, um, yeah, that spun me out when I was putting it together. Faith, that's the word pistis. In this particular um, context, there's, you know, there's about that much in, in a concordance telling you all about faith. But this one here in this context means a faith, a faith that you have and a faith that you should have that understands and knows and recognises what God did for mankind at the cross of Golgotha, a substitutionary atoning sacrifice when the Son of God took our sins upon himself as a propitiation for all, making salvation available to all, but only through faith. That is the most mature faith you can ever have. And now he mentions service, diakonos, fulfilling both as a pastor, a deacon, all of the servanthood that you see in this church. The people on the greeting table, the people who put out the chairs, they put them back, the audio video guys, um, uh, the greeters, the cafe um, teams that, uh, that turn up every Sunday, give us beautiful coffees and there's beautiful food down there. That's the service within a church. And perseverance is hupomone, that's chit. I hope you all got this in spades. You ready? Cheerful endurance while waiting patiently. I don't wait patiently very well. You know, I, I, I've told you before, I, I'm a bulldozer. I was told I was a bulldozer many, month, many years ago in a Bible study, and I, and I have to give that's true. I don't wait patiently, but you have to wait 
patiently until the last Gentile Romans 11.25 when the God says to the son, go get your bride. When the last Gentile comes into the church, he then says, it's done, it's time. Ah, oh. So I hope you're witnessing and evangelising everyone you can possibly do it because you never know that you might be responsible for the one that brings us all up. And this verse, and your deeds of late are greater than at first. True believers... Now, this is the commendation. There are true believers within this congregation. So many of the commentators belt this congregation and they miss the point. There's some really mature believing people in this church. And this part of this church is utterly pleasing to Jesus. But, and there's always a but, it's taking its place alongside internal corruption within the church and it is severe corruption. Because Jesus starts now. One verse of commendation, now several verses of condemnation. Verse 20, but I have this against you that you tolerate, you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and she teaches and leads my bond servants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And Jesus says, but I have this against you. Despite the presence of the believing core of this church, there is also a confused and wanton group of misled people. And that fall, that burden falls directly on the shoulders of the leadership of any church. And I think you know what my, my attitude is towards people who try that in this church. There is a severe sanction because they are tolerating the woman Jezebel. Do you know what? Um, I don't know if you're sharp, sharp enough when you're reading um, different versions, translations of the Bible. Uh, I've got 17, and the majority text, you have Textus Rex, uh, Rex um, Texas, uh, te yeah, that one. <laughs> I, I have to have a drink. I'm getting very dry. That's what chemotherapy does to you. And... Uh, and what they're saying is there is a severe sanction against the leadership of this church. Sin in anyone's life as a Christian is a virus. Do you understand? And if it's not dealt with with the antibiotic called repentance, it will have consequences. So is that true in the life of a church where toleration of that which is offensive towards God will inevitably bring about the loss of witness for the church and the removal of the lampstand. Jezebel may be her real name, or it is an appellation or a description given by Jesus to infer that there is a woman in this church acting in the same manner as the Jezebel of the Old Testament. And she was Canaanite bad news, that woman. I've just got a few verses here that sort of bring about her finish. Uh, in 2 Kings 9, 4 to 10, this is when God is sick and tired and finished with Ahab in the northern kingdom. And in verse 4, so the young man, this is a servant of the prophet Elisha, and he was told by Elisha to do this. He went to Ramoth Gilead, and when he came, behold, the captains of the army were sitting, and he said, I have a word for you, O captain. And Yehu said, for which one of us? And he said, for you, O captain. He arose and went into the house and he poured the oil on his, that's Yehu's head, and said to him, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I have anointed you king over the people of the Lord, even over Israel, the northern kingdom. Verse seven, you shall strike the house of Ahab, your master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all of the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. For the whole house of Ahab shall perish. That means every son and daughter that uh, Ahab uh, produced, they're gone. And I will cut off from Ahab every male person, both bond and free in Israel. 
Verse 9, And I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, not another one of the bad kings, and the house of Baasha, the son of Ahiah. The dogs shall eat Jezebel in the te territory of Jezreel, and none shall bury her. Then he opened the door and fled. Now, I'll be a bit delicate here. If you've actually um, studied this particular passage, you know that the... Um, the soldiers go into the house and they kill uh, um, Ahab. And what they do with uh, Jezebel is they actually throw her out about a second storied window. And she goes down, hits the street, and the dogs eat her. Uh, and there's nothing left. You see, one of the things that we don't understand in modern society is in those societies, and even in the time of Jesus, dogs weren't lovely domestic pets. They were just roaming bunches of wicked, nasty animals who were just after any carrion they could get. And boy, they hit the bonanza when they came into this particular place. Notice the fear of God. This is what I want to um, um, show you, the contrast between this young man speaking on behalf of Elisha, who got the word from God himself, the God of the universe, I think this is a letter penned by Jesus and I'm happy to believe that this woman's name was Jezebel. Are you waiting for this? You know I can't leave a word alone. I can't leave a phrase alone. I can't leave a, 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 a sentence alone. And when I was looking at Jezebel, they're often compound um, words in the original language. Because Bel, B-E-L, was the name of the uh, first supreme god in the Akkadian, the Sumerian, uh, Nimrodian um, religions in the Mesopotamian area right at the start. When we did last week, like uh, the Tower of Babel, give me a break with that. And uh, the name was Jezebel, so I looked it up and I thought it would be a compound um, uh, name. But in Hebrew, you have got to just smile at God's irony in his word. Do you know what Jezebel means in Hebrew? Pure and virginal. <laughs> and I looked at it, I said, you have to be kidding me. But that's the irony that God has in places. In his, sometimes you're just reading scripture and all of a sudden something like this hits you and you go, wake up, take, take a, a good look. And this woman calls herself a prophetess. She calls herself a, prophet, a prophetess. And she teaches and leads my bond servants. Bond servants are people who have given over their life and faith to Jesus Christ. But these ones are way off track so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Calling herself a prophetess, that's the worst thing you can do. The self-assessment of the reprobate mind. In the Old Testament, if a person claimed to be a prophet of the Most High God and prophesied a falsehood, one, they were stoned to death. That's how serious it is speaking on behalf of God. And do you know how serious it is for anyone to stand behind one of these things and tell you what's in the scriptures? In the Old Testament, if you told a lie, claiming it to be from God, you were stoned to death. But look at what we've got now for the last 30 years, the new apostolic reformation, who say that if a prophet in their association is about about 70% accurate, then he is a genuine prophet. Seriously? You, you know, when people look at these things in their Christian uh, life and experience and say, oh, well, these are secondary issues. Do you know what I mean? No, they're not. Because if you're going to tell a lie on behalf of God, you have no fear of God. And that's what I'm talking about when we all go up there. I hope we've got as clean a conscience as we can have and that we've never misspoken or misrepresented God to anyone in this world, either by what we've said or what we've done. It's so, it, this letter is so good 
because it shows us what the reality is that there are believers in this church and there are other people who are uh, sort of drowning in the deep things of Satan and they've been led astray by a self-assessed person. By the way, and I have to make this, and I said this to my wife on the way down, I, you've got to be very careful when you attack this woman uh, because it's not to remonstrate against women who are genuinely called by God to speak for, forth the word of God, not only to the Israelites in the Old Testament, but to women in, in the modern uh, Christian scene. I would love you. I have tried and tried and tried to get my wife to come up and stand at this and tell you and give you a testimony about her time in Russia. Every day, it was God showing up in miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. And life was really tough over there. I'm talking about 2001. It was only two th uh, 10 years after the fall of the um, Berlin Wall. And things were really, really tough. But when she came back to Perth, because like a meal over there, what they, her and her interpreter would go down to the market. They're always fresh food markets because they don't have big um, supermarkets everywhere. They didn't in those days. So they would buy one tomato, one potato, one egg, and go back to the apartment, slice it up, and that's what they would make a meal of. Just those three things, okay? When she came back to Perth, she was in Woolworths a few days after she got back, and there were these two ladies walking along with the big carts, do you know what I mean? Loaded with food, complaining about how tough life was. <laughs> you know what? You know, when I say, uh, when I see people, you know, um, in, in the past, like at, at, at various venues, and they say, ooh, no, I don't want that, ooh. You know, I, I don't like that. I, I, too rich for me, you know. What they need is a good famine, you know. <laughs> I can remember when Sue and I and the kids were in um, uh, Russia. That was back in 1998. And when we were going down from our, our, our sleeping quarters down to the dining room, you could smell what you were going to be given about 50 metres away. And it was liver. <laughs> and we had our three um, Russian girls as interpreters. And I'd, I, could, I could go the potato. I had no problem. Russian potatoes are beautiful. They're a meal in themselves. Yum. But I kept pushing the liver around the plate, trying to work out what to do with it. <laughs> and the Russian girl said, Stuart, you don't like? I said, not really, no. May we have it? I said, yes. <laughs> but listen, there are things that um, are quite uh, obvious in this church, but there are also women called by God in the Old Testament to speak on his behalf. So there's no misogyny here. There's Miriam, Moses' sister. She was a prophetess. Deborah, the judge. Holder in 2 Kings 22, 14 to 16. Noadiah in Nehemiah 6, 14. Isaiah's wife was a prophetess. Uh, Anna in the temple at the time of Jesus' birth, Luke 2, you remember that? She, she was about 104 when they brought Jesus in. Do the math, it's fascinating. And the daughters of Philip in Acts 21 verse 9, who told Paul that if he went back to Jerusalem, he'd come back from this area of Asia, uh, and they said to him, they grabbed him and, and they put a rope around his wrist and said, if you go down to Jerusalem, this is going to happen to you. So these daughters were um, prophesying what would happen to Paul. And he went there anyway, because he knew he had been told by the Holy Spirit that it was going to happen. Yet scripture... Scripture never calls any of them self-proclaimed. They were all anointed by God. And here, she teaches and leads my bondservants. Jesus says, my bondservants. 
They belong to him through faith, but look what's happening to them. They are being led astray so that they commit acts of immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. In Thyatira, the leadership had made the very mistake that the elders in Ephesus were militant about. And in Ephesus, it was only the preaching of Christian doctrine that was allowed. And now the Thyatira elders failed the command to test the spirits to discern whether they are of God. So she, this woman, is condemned by Jesus himself as a false prophet and a false teacher and leading actual believers called bondservants into deadly area, era. Sorry. And if you remember our teaching in Matthew chapter 18, that's all about damaging the faith of true Christians. Do you understand? And there are severe consequences to those who lead young and naive Christians astray. And you don't want to be anywhere near that. And so she is condemned by Jesus. And even bond servants, that really shook me when I was going through there. I thought bond servants, uh, like Paul, James, Peter and Jude, they're all called uh, bond servants of Jesus. So the same faith level was apparently in these men or women, but they were led into sin. And it had to be obviously a very powerful, deceiving spirit. And this is a warning to every one of us. Do you understand? Whatever I hear and whatever someone speaks to me and whatever some article I get, I always measure it with this. And so should you. Because I think a few years ago, John MacArthur says, all knowledge, all value, all uh, intelligence lies within the pages of this book. Nowhere else. Nowhere else. And let Jesus, look what he just said now, after all of this behaviour, and I gave her time to repent, oh, how so often has the grace and mercy of our Lord and Saviour, who is not wishing for any to perish, as recorded by, recorded by Peter, this grace and this mercy is turned back upon him and thrown in his face. Satan started the error as uh, Lucifer and the iniquity was in his heart, which was revealed in his five eye wills in Isaiah 14, 13 and 14. But you, this is God saying to Lucifer, you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. That's the angelic realm. I will sit on the Mount of Assembly. That's where the great throne is of God is. In the recesses of the north, that's as high as you can get. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. That's the Shekinah glory. And here it is, the utmost in pride and vanity. I will make myself like the most high. Do you know, notice in that last line that even as reprobate as Lucifer was at this moment, he never assumed that he could be greater than God, but he wanted to be like God the same as God. And that's the same furphy he sold Adam in, in the Garden of Eden. If you have your eyes open, you will be like God. It's the same thing. You know, people get uh, other people uh, confused by praising them or, you know, giving them compliments and all the rest of it, and you start to believe it. Uh, that's where you have a wife like this one and kids like mine and grandkids like mine and if I ever decided to listen to any of my uh, propaganda, uh, I get ripped to pieces by these people here. That's why you are in a marriage when you run a church. If you're on your own, I'll tell you this right now, you're clear pickings. You need someone who loves you who can tell you the truth all of the time, every time. This woman in Thyatira is never recorded as repenting. How many of the bond servants did is not recorded. But if they were blood-bought believers in Jesus, they are still saved. But I wouldn't, I, this is a joke, please. It's not theology. But I wouldn't want to be in their wings at the beamer seat. Revelation 2, 22 and 23. Behold, 
I will throw her on a bed of sickness. Now notice this, the of sickness is in italics. It's not in the original, all right? It's not in the Greek. So someone stuck that in there. If you ever see words in italics in your Bible, actually just ignore them and read the verse again and see if it still makes sense. But the translators try to help um, uh, by putting in um, uh, words that aren't in the original because of the way that Greek and Hebrew uh, uh, developed. But there is a problem with the of sickness anyway, and I'll tell you why. And those who commit adultery with her, he will cast into great tribulation unless they repent And now look at the next three words, of her deeds. You would expect that God would say, of your deeds. But they're so deep, these ones, they are following her teaching. And anyone who believes in her and follows her who is not born again, verse 23 applies, and I will kill her children, her spiritual offspring, with pestilence. And all the churches will know, every church will know, that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. The adultery here, mentioned here, is either actual and physical or spiritual. And I tend towards physical according to the uh, mention in verse 23 as to being punished with uh, pestilence, which is an old English word for disease. And those who refuse the mercy of God and refuse to repent of her deeds, they will be cast into great tribulation. And by the way, we're talking about the end of the first century. It's not the great tribulation which is coming in the second half of the seven years. It is the great tribulation that happened to Christians in the next 200 years under some really terrifying Roman emperors. However, it is possible also to relate this circumstance and what Jesus has just said to the apostate church as described in Revelation 17 and 18. And boy, we're going to have fun when we get there. As those who succumb to that woman of Babylon. Revelation 18, 3 to 8. For all of the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality. Look at that statement. For some of the bond servants in the church at Thyatira have fallen in the same way. You know, Satan hasn't got a, an original trick in his bag, but he keeps using the same ones. Why? Because they work. And the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. Verse 4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. This is Jesus talking to the believing remnant in Thyatira. Don't go near this person. Don't go near these um, um, acts. Don't go near this behaviour. And yet in Revelation 18, the voice from heaven is saying the same thing. Come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and receive of her plagues. It's Thyatira all, all over again. For her sins have piled up as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Verse 6, pay her back even as she has paid, and give back to her double according to her deeds. In the cup which she has mixed, mix twice much for her. To the degree that she glorified herself and lived sensuously, to the same degree give her torment and mourning, for she says in her heart, I sit as a queen and am not a widow and I will never see mourning. And that's brilliant. I'm going to wait till we get there. Hopefully, I've asked Jesus to hold off the rapture until we finish Revelation. But um, in verse 8, For this reason in one day her plagues will come, pestilence and mourning and famine, and shall we be burned up with fire? For the Lord God who judges her is strong. That is such a parallel to this church. And Revelation 2, 24 and 25, and Jesus is saying, but to you, he's going back to the believing remnant 
in this church. There is a believing, godly rev, uh, remnant in this church. But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, do not hold this teaching who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you. Stay away from it. Stay away from it. How many times in the last 30 years I have seen uh, baby Christians and carnal Christians dabbling in things that they shouldn't go anywhere near because they don't have the wisdom yet or they're not pastored properly to stay away from things that seem to be not harmful but will take you down a track and it's all downhill. And you tell people sometimes this is not a good idea. No. We had a guy in the big church that we were in uh, in the 90s and I think I think I have I hope I haven't told you this, but he came out of a uh, totally immoral, uh, totally debauched lifestyle. And he was jumping up and down, I love Jesus, I love Jesus, I know the truth now and all the rest of it. And I said, oh, that's wonderful. And he says, and I'm going to go back and, mis- and, and um, minister to all of my friends that are still in that lifestyle. This is a baby Christian you know the first, that joy you get when you first believe, you're walking around on a cloud and you're just so happy and you're so pleased and you see the light everywhere. And this guy was like that. And he said, I'm going to go back and minister to all my friends who are in that lifestyle. Never saw him again. Never saw him again. If you've got a problem with grog, don't live across the road from a bottle store. If you've got a problem with gambling, don't go anywhere near the casino. And yet people do. They drive past. I've seen them. I've seen people going places and they say, oh, it's, there's no problem. I just drive past that on my way to work every day. Every day. I said, is there not another way you can go? No, every day. Satan is so clever, but it's so simple. Do not hold to this teaching who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call him. I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, Jesus puts a stricture on them. Hold fast what you have until I come. And these are the true believers in this church who have not succumbed to the satanic influence of this individual. They have rejected her teaching, her prophetic utterances, and refused association with her whatsoever. These are the people who Jesus praised in verse 19. Jesus' exhortation to them is to hold to the faith until he comes. And that obviously means the second advent. But when he is saying to these true believers... It also should include the leadership of this church. And this is a savage indictment of this church because they're not doing anything about the problem. And so it's like um, you know, having petrol bombs all around that no one's lit yet. But one day someone will and someone will get hurt because they're not assuming the leadership of the church and obeying Jesus because he's the head of the church. Revelation 2, 26 to 28. He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will get... Now, listen to this. I want a show of hands. Who's an overcomer? About 38%. That's very good. Um, (laughs) The others are are modest, all right? We've got 100% there. Listen, to he who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him, and I'm going to change that. This is to you. Do you understand? This is your destiny in Christ. I will give you 
authority over the nations, and you shall rule them with the rod of iron, as the vessels of the potter are broken in pieces, as I also have received authority from my father, and I will give him the morning star. That's your destiny. And it amazes me in my, all my decades of being a Christian to see how people slip from where they should be and give up those privileges. They'll still be up there. But there's a hierarchy of rewards for genuine Christians when you get up there. And I want for all of you to be in that line there, to, give, uh, to be given influence over the, and authority over the nations and ruling them, oh, I'd love this, with a rod of iron, and the vessels of the potter, are like the vessels of the potter, are broken to pieces. And I will give him the morning star. Jesus gives a specific believer, the overcomer in these letters, those who have not succumbed to the lasciviousness of this world, but remain steadfast to Jesus. The same subordinate promise that God gave the Father to Jesus in Psalm 2, verse 8. And you and I and the overcomers here in this congregation will rule and reign with Jesus in the millennial kingdom under his authority. And Jesus is the morning star. And first you have the morning star, and then what do you have? The sun of righteousness rising with healing in his wings. Do you understand in his hands? And then comes the day, the glorious day of his kingdom in which righteousness will finally reign on this planet. I was um, at a, a seminar on Friday night and there were um, uh, speeches about you know, turning this country around and, and uh, getting it back uh, to the way it was. Uh, and I would love that as much as anyone else, because I've got a three-year-old granddaughter and a five-month-old grandson, and I would love to see them grow up, be happy, get a job, get married, get kids. But I'm so, sorry, we're just far too close to the end. We're far too close to the end. And there is no righteousness in any government anywhere on the face of this earth. That's what I'm hanging out for to see Jesus, to rule and reign in righteousness finally. And he, in verse 29, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is to the born again believer in the last 1900 years to hear and to receive and to understand what Jesus has just dictated to us in this letter. And it is fascinating that this phrase is now at the end of this letter and the remaining three, it's at the end of this letter, whereas previously it was in the body of the letter. So there is a glance and a uh, insight into what is happening now because it, he is talking to us. If you can hear the wisdom in the scripture, if you can hear the voice of the Holy Spirit telling you things, exhorting you, encouraging you to keep the things that God has given you through righteousness, through his sacrifice on the cross, don't you ever give them up for anything, not anything. And that is what is the message in this, in this letter. But I am also absolutely convinced that in every seminary that tries to train up pastors and leaders of churches, this should be mandatory learning. Because there they failed and they tolerated. And the moment you tolerate, you reap the whirlwind. And so I just pray I, Sue and I pray all of the time that God has given us this church um, and it's such a responsibility because it's tough enough being a Christian. It's tough enough being a, a father or a mother. It's tough enough being kids under Christian uh, parents. 
and it's tough being grandkids. But the biggest um, pressure on anyone is a pastor and a shepherd of the sheep because we are held to a much higher standard. Why? Because God has entrusted to anyone who pastors a church the spiritual well-being of his children. You all belong to him. You don't belong to my church. You belong to his church. And boy, I can feel, feel those laser-like eyes sometimes just looking at me saying, preach the word, brother or son. <laughs> Father, I just come before you this afternoon. In this letter, Father, you have shown us so many things that there is both good and danger in every situation that a Christian can face. And Father, we've heard the words of Jesus. We've heard the exhortation of, of Jesus, Jesus that whoever is given the hidden manna, who is ever given the right to rule over the nations, to hold fast what we already have and never let it go, never let it be damaged, never let it be walked away from. Father, I just pray that you would instill in the congregation today this firm resolve to stick with Jesus, with the word of God, with the fellowship among the Christian community, Father. And even as we do this, we are still exhorted to pray for our leaders because it doesn't matter who they are, it doesn't matter what they've done. They can still come to a statement of faith in Jesus Christ just like every one of us here, Father, because you had grace and mercy on us when we were in the kingdom of darkness and you, Father, brought us into the glorious light. So we still ought to pray for our leaders and for our, our lost family because it's so close and I, I've just been talking to my um, older brother. He's 79 going on 80. And I've been telling him for 30 years and my wife has been telling from him for 30 years, there's only two places you can go, Bill. You either go up or you go down. And he just says, oh, no, that's for you. Father, I just pray that you would soften his heart. Let him hear your truth and your word through your love and grace and mercy, Father. And it, it, it applies to every one of us here. I know we have loved ones who have not yet received Jesus. And I pray, Father, that on their behalf you will have mercy and grace towards them and shine a light into their darkness. And all God's people said...